Good afternoon or evening, wherever you are, folks. It is still me. It is still World War II with TV and Resistance and Spies Week. And this is the first of our two shows looking at the French resistance in World War II. We had um, that incredible examination of what was going on in Yugoslavia on Tuesday. I can promise you tonight won't be quite as complicated as that. But if we will be breaking down the various groups, who they were, what their aims were, how they were set up, and what what and how they eventually kind of worked together for the freedom of France. So joining me tonight. I've had some really multi-talented people on my shows over the last few months, but um, Matthew Cobb really is um, incredible. You're a zoologist, all sorts of studies into smell, you've published in all sorts of things, but you've also done two books about the resistance. So welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Hello, everybody, wherever you are. And before we get into your PowerPoint and your talk about the resistance, I know you studied and you taught in France, but where, where did your interest in the resistance sort of come from? Um, well, I I grew up in the 60s when, uh, you know, uh, there were plenty of uh, war. There was a, a series called um, Moonstrike, which some of your older viewers uh, may remember, which was a British TV drama series from about 1962 or 63. And even though it was on at about nine o'clock in the evening, for some reason, my mother uh, let me watch it. And that was all about the resistance and SOE and, uh, you know, Lysander pilots and all that kind of stuff. So I had a long, I've had a long running interest, but I think it's basically just growing up in the 60s when uh, the war and resistance was much more present in people's mm -hmm. minds uh, than it is today. But that, but that interest, interesting that like myself, it for me was wish me luck was the, was there. So we, so the yeah. late 80s, but we have, we've all of us, whether we have studied history professionally or we do it as an amateur, we just read books we have this rather, I'm not going to say Hollywood ideal of resistance, but there is this sort of stereotypical cliched idea, Allo, Allo didn't help in the 90s. Well, I think that did, that did for it. I mean, the point about Allo, Allo is that it was designed as a piss take of Secret Army, which was a very yeah. serious... But in uh, the end, when I watched Secret Army, mistake. Secret Army is now funnier than our Allo, Allo now, because you watch Secret Army with the reference of what happened in, happened in our Allo, and it just seems equally silly. Um, yeah. I mean, anyway... LOLO, I think, just put the kibosh on any uh, or virtually put the kibosh on any attempt to dramatize uh, the resistance in the UK. I mean, that's not the case in France, obviously. Uh, yeah. but it's been very hard in the UK to get over that uh, caricature. Um, and that's been the problem for the British and Americans. And for France, although we're going down a rabbit hole there, it's been the difficulty of getting over just exactly what their involvement was in, in World War II. You know, I, I did a book review, review show a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about that book, France, The Dark Years by um, Jackson, and, Jackson, and how it's taken, you know, 70 plus years for the French to kind of find this even keel of being able to look back on their history, warts and all, and say, well, we were good here, we were less good there. And it's it's been very complicated history. And and I think now it's it's better now. There's more monuments going up. You go to places um, where the resistance activities occurred and there are decent information panels and, and museums now. So I think it's it's getting to an era where, at least within France, people are understanding it. But I, the point tonight is to kind of break it all down for, for the English-speaking viewers and say, so how did it all begin and where did it all start? So um, obviously... The, the Germans invaded France in 1940, and that we're not going to go into the military campaign, how that was fought, but immediately um, there's, an, there's, there's, there's statements made because some of the French army get back to Britain, some, uh, there are other French colonials around the world. And so give us an idea of when, when the kind of spark of resistance sort of began. Well, I think without going into the, into the military campaign, it's really important to get your heads around what happened, because in particular, uh, thanks to the nefarious influence of the Simpsons, uh, the French are often uh, portrayed as cheese-eating surrender monkeys. Um, and the actual facts are really quite stark. And in, in particular, the soldiers were absolutely betrayed by their high-ups, which is, I mean, it's important to understand yeah. quite what a catastrophe the fall of France was. It was the most militarised army in the world. I mean, far, far more, many more tanks than the Germans, but with an awful leadership, uh, both political and military, the collapse happened very, very quickly. And as a result, there were 1.8 million prisoners and 300,000 dead or severely injured. So that's 2 million men have just been taken out of the country 
uh, out, you know, out of the everyday life of, of the country. So you can imagine what an absolute catastrophe this was, What how earth-shaking uh, it was for the French population. This is a chap watching the Germans uh, parading down the uh, Champs-Élysées and he's in tears. So uh, the catastrophe of what happened uh, during the war uh, in the very brief uh, Battle of France is extremely important for what happens in the in the French psyche. And one of the people who uh, was able to escape from France just before it fell was General de Gaulle, who was a, an extremely minor um, uh, extremely minor general in the, in the war office. Uh, he was completely unknown. He'd written one book about the importance of tank warfare in the 1930s. He was big into his tanks, was de Gaulle. Um, and he escapes uh, from uh, Bordeaux, which is where the French government had fled to, on a plane to London. And he arrives in London, and basically there is him, there's his uh, aide-de-camp and a, a handful of others, and that is it. And he manages to kind of blag his way uh, onto the BBC uh, with the help of Churchill, who initially at least liked the cut of his jib, and he gives a speech uh, on the 18th of June. This is incredibly well known now in France. It's the, the appeal of the, 14th, uh, the 18th of July, uh, June, sorry, and it's, as you can see from this little picture here, it's on the every French school, on the front of every French school, there is this appeal that de Gaulle makes. And he, he gives this speech on the BBC. Uh, it wasn't actually recorded at the time. Uh, not many people listened to it. And those people who did listen to it, most of them weren't terribly impressed from what we can gather. But the key thing is what he says in there, he makes uh, an appeal to all soldiers to join him. And he says the, the, the flame of the French resistance will never die. Now, what de Gaulle meant by that was not what we think of, as French resistance. He did not have in mind having a load of blokes running around uh, with Sten guns, blowing up trains or any of that kind of thing. De Gaulle, unlike Churchill, did not like, um, you know, non-uniformed uh, forces. He was very, very suspicious of them because he was a military man and they generally don't like people out of uniform because they're not sure who they are and what they're doing and so on. Whereas uh, Churchill had a very romantic view of uh, guerrilla warfare. So what de Gaulle was hoping for was that the Vichy apparatus, what we call the Vichy apparatus, the, the French state, the army would effectively split and parts of the army, the navy and the air force would come over to the side of Britain because that was the only country left fighting. Everywhere else had been wiped out. The uh, Americans were not yet uh, involved in the war. Um, they were, you know, having a, an isolationist policy, uh, which we can still see the legacy of uh, today in many aspects of U.S. politics. So de Gaulle was really hoping that, you know, key figures in in the French armed forces would come and join him and they'd be able to continue uh, the battle, literally continue the battle as an armed forces. That didn't happen. The French, I mean, throughout the, the next three or four years, there were continual illusions that the French state, the French armed forces, Vichy Petain himself, who ended up in charge of uh, Vichy France, which is the southern non-occupied zone, that all these forces were really working uh, for the Allies and they would come over. None of that happened. All of these people were absolutely rotten collaborators like Petain or complete kind of uh, uh, cowards and lickspittles like uh, the supreme commander of the French army, General Végon, uh, yeah. who he was, a, he, was a he was a career military man and he'd never come under fire. Now, I'm no kind of armchair, <laughs> armchair battle fighter. I'm sure if a bullet came anywhere <laughs> near me, I'd run a mile, but I'm not claiming to run the army. Anyway, uh, so de Gaulle's hope completely failed. Uh, and what happened over the next four years is something which uh, he wasn't entirely happy with. Uh, but in the end, as we'll see, he actually rode to power. It's ex extremely important for forging a new France uh, in the aftermath of the occupation. So what was resistance? How many people were involved? Well, as far as we can tell, because of course nobody was keeping records, um, there were around about half a million organized resistors. These are people who in the post-war world were able to literally claim benefits so yeah. they could prove that they had done active service. Um, and so that's around 2% of the population, which I think is pretty good. What it means is that most of the population was hanging around waiting for something to happen. They weren't going to risk things because in most most people don't. They're very sensible. Um, 
perhaps 100,000 resistors died in the war. They were either executed, a very small minority, died in deportation, the vast majority, um, or were killed during the fighting. And the duration of people's engagement, involvement, varied between something like four years, uh, like the whole of the occupation for a man like Henri Frenet, who I'll be talking a bit about, uh, down to literally days uh, with the turncoats of the Paris police, who, when the Allies and the Free French Army were nearly at the ports of, uh, at the gates of Paris, uh, decided to launch an insurrection. So there's a whole varied uh, involvement in resistance. And as you indicated, what has been striking is that after the war, the history History of what had happened got rewritten, partly as a way of overcoming uh, disputes about the who had collaborated and who had fought. De Gaulle argues that uh, there was la France résistante, the whole country resisted, and that Vichy was not France. Vichy was uh, France, he said, was in London. He was a bit like Louis the Sixteenth, l'État c'est moi, or Louis the Fourteenth, l'État c'est moi. I am the state. He was arguing. Um, and the French Communist Party equally uh, kind of exaggerated its role. It called itself uh, the party of 75,000 executed men. I mean, there weren't 75,000 resistance fighters executed, never mind executed communists. So there was a lot of exaggeration went on. Academics, historians have studied this in great detail. But what's very striking, what's striking to me in doing my work is that they only they've only concentrated on some of the key groups. So, for example, there's a group called Term of Vengeance, uh, which was set up in 1941, had about 30,000 members, 584 of them died, uh, but it's virtually absent from academic history, so you won't find it mentioned at all. But the archives of this group, there are 17,873 documents in this archive, which are now in a library. Nobody's studied it. Nobody's looked at it. And the only person who's really looked at this, the history of this, is an amateur French historian called Marc Chantron, uh, who's got a great website uh, devoted to this. So what was resistance? Well, we talked about, you know, Sten guns and leather jackets, that image. Um, but in reality, the groups, the organized groups, were not the only significant or even the main forms of resistance. So I tried to list out uh, this afternoon, thinking about this, all the various forms of what we could call resistance, resistance to uh, the occupier. This could be incredibly simple, like uh, chalking up a V. I think we've got a picture of that, uh, which is from uh, Nantes. Uh, with little kids, yeah, kids drawing up a V. They're scrawling a V for victory with the Gaullist uh, cross of Lorraine. Uh, and this was a part of a campaign launched by the BBC, V for victory. Scroll, so just putting up with a bit of paint or bending a metro ticket so that it's in mm. the shape of a V, that was an act of resistance. Um, you could listen to the BBC French service, which was illegal and also became extremely important as a, a vehicle for information uh, and propaganda. The BBC played an absolutely fundamental role in the in the resistance. You might be going on demonstrations. So they've got a picture there of the 11th of November demonstration uh, at the at the uh, for the uh, at the tomb of the unknown soldier in 1940. This court, this was organised kind of semi spontaneously by the the students in Paris. Um, was bigged up by the BBC. They called for everybody to go down to it. Hundreds of prison school children, university students go on the this demonstration there's a huge repression nobody's killed but it was uh, a pretty savage beating they got people might involved in individual sabotage so from the very first moment that the german troops uh, arrived and the, the the settled situation of occupation people started cutting telephone wires and this was generally a very bad thing to do because then you get shot a number of the people who just you know as individuals shinned up a telegraph pole snip the wires I mean, the Germans can then work out very quickly where the wire's been cut. And many of these poor men uh, were just taken out and, and shot. There was more organized forms of activity, organized propaganda. So this could be the painting of slogans on bridges or giving out leaflets or eventually, as we'll see, producing newspapers, working with German rank and file soldiers, arguing with them, talking to them, producing bulletins with them. 
even having meetings, again, incredibly dangerous, even producing films. So films were made towards the end in November 43. And then in, in Paris, around the liberation, two fantastic films were made, one about the escape lines, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, but and the other about the actual activities of the insurrection. Mm. These were used as propaganda all over the world, shown in newsreels. And just to jump in, because I like to jump in every now and then, I'm really glad you talked about it will raise the question, what is resistance? Because it's come up on World War II TV many times. And, you know, my partner's French and my friends here are French. And the average person can thinks of a country that's been occupied as at one end of the scale is the people actually going out, as you say, with Sten guns, blowing up trains. Now, at the other end is the dirty collaborator who are selling allied pilots for gold and who are you know, going around in leather coats working for the Gestapo. And, of course, both of those extremes exist. But in the middle, is 95, 96% of France, which is just kind of trying to survive, trying to feed their family, trying to keep a roof over their heads and and, and waiting for, for, for things to get better, as most of us are. And, you know, my granddad, who was six years in the Royal Artillery in, in Britain, was the first to say he only became a soldier because he was taken away and trained very gradually and slowly to become just about an effective soldier. He was manning a soldier, basically. Yeah, yeah. But as a 30-something-year-old as a man with two kids, he would never have joined the resistance unit had Britain been occupied. He would have left that to someone else. And I, I think people forget that those those kind of people make up the majority of a country. But what you're, the point you're making about bending a metro ticket, putting a V, or just giving a German soldier a dirty look, it's all part of... Resist, on, all I, part I, of I'm going to have to... I've control. just lost my sound. I can't hear anything anymore. I know exactly what the problem is. Hang on a sec. Sorry. Okay. Apologies for this, vote. Okay. I think we should be coming back. Can you hear me now? Can you say something? Yeah, hear me now? No. No. Okay, right. No. I'll just do this. Okay. Right. That should work. Okay. You hear me now? Yeah. Yep. I can hear you now. All right. Sorry Good. about that. No, it's fine. I was just saying you that this idea about resistance, what yeah. is it? You know, yeah. giving a German soldier a dirty look, you know, just um, making a German coming into your restaurant feel a bit less welcome than a French person. It's all part of the act, isn't it? It's all part of defiance, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. And what you got to remember is that you, to join a group, I mean, you couldn't, you know, they didn't, they weren't putting up posters and saying, well, we'll meet you in this cafe. You had to bump into them. And if you didn't know anybody who was already active and you didn't meet them, how could you do anything? Uh, I mean, you know, it was the, the groups that people joined were generally completely random. It just so happened that they did bump into somebody or they talked to somebody or whatever, and then they they got involved. But, I mean, you know, there's two I, two aspects. There's the aspects you've just mentioned about people actually having a desire to do it and quite understandably being reticent when you could be killed very easily for this activity. Um, and the other is actually having the opportunity. Um, yeah. There are other ways that people were involved. Uh, you had, act organ we talk about organized propaganda, you had organized sabotage. Probably the most audacious of this was uh, Andre Keller, who was a post office engineer, and he tapped the main Paris Berlin phone cable in 1942. He's part of the Term of Vengeance group I, I mentioned. Uh, on a rather more trivial scale, but very significant, in the countryside, a man called Georges Guangua, who was a, a French. Uh, a, a Communist Party member, he he blew up a hay baler on his own. And this was really significant at the end of 1942. It showed the countryside uh, was rising, which has all sorts of resonances uh, in French uh, history, uh, given the various movements there were uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. People could also do something like going on strike. So in general, striking was not possible, but a very significant strike took place in May, June 1941. Uh, miners in the north of Paris, in the north of France, uh, went on strike over their wages, right? So they went over their wages, but that turned into obviously a strike against uh, the occupier. Um, 270 strikers and their wives were, de were deported and half of them uh, never returned. Um, more significantly, um, an individual could go on strike, a man called Leon Branchard in October 1942. He refused to drive a train from Montauban in the south, uh, which was carrying Jews from the town of Breve. Um, the train went anyway, eventually, uh, but he refused to drive it. 
Uh, he was eventually arrested. He ended up in Belsen because he, he was part of a resistance group. He survived and he was later named righteous among the nations because he had all the work he'd done to save uh, Jews in Belsen uh, in Breath. Um, there were escape lines, as I've indicated. These escape lines, which were often done with MI9, which was the British uh, escapers network. Uh, there's something called the Comet Line, for example, which started in Belgium and you would get from Belgium to Gibraltar in a week, you know, this is being, you're being, and you've got to remember this and before the, uh, the initial stage, this involved getting over the uh, demarcation line, which was heavily uh, controlled by the German troops between the Northern zone, which was occupied by the Germans and the South where uh, Vichy was. Um, you would, some people hid Jewish children. For example, a, a village called Le Chambon Solignon kept loads, saved loads and loads of Jewish children by, this was mainly Protestant village, uh, by hiding Jewish children and pretending that they were their own children. Youths in, the Par in Paris, when uh, Jews had to start wearing the, uh, the yellow star, they wore satirical uh, stars. They made their own stars, but they put the name of their jazz their jazz stars on them or swing for swing music or zazu which was the kind of um like the zoot suit wearers um you know so that was a you could get arrested for doing that but it was a matter of you know one siding with the jews and two being satirical about the the, the occupation um you could collect intelligence. Now, it's very hard to know what people were doing in terms of intelligence networks because the archives are, for example from mi6 are all closed and there are plenty of people who were kind of fantasists to be honest about what they were doing um you would you could avoid labor conscription we'll see this was really important from 1943 onwards where uh tens of thousands of french youth were supposed to go to germany to work to meet the german need for arms production and they refused to go they took to the hills to what's called the maki and so that was a form of resistance just not going um Individuals might carry out armed resistance acts that's pretty dangerous and generally went led badly, ended badly. The most obvious form is armed resistance by groups, um, which could be, for example, the Maki fighting back uh, against the Germans and the Glier Plateau in uh, March 1944. 149 of them were killed. Um, or you'd be involved in uh, sabotage organized by the special operations executive who parachuted in their their agents um but even then this could lead to terrible retaliation uh, from the germans and then finally uh there would be insurrection in uh the june august period where you'd actually be involved in taking over whole towns and so on so what didn't the resistance do what haven't i mentioned this is people always ask well why didn't they do this and it, you might think it's fairly obvious they didn't stop the trains they blew up plenty of train lines. They did not stop the trains going to the camps. So 80, 90,000 Jews, French Jews were deported uh, on those trains. And the resistance did not, I mean, some of the resistance knew what was happening because information was coming back, certainly from 90, late 1942, 43 onwards, about what was happening in the camps. And they didn't do it. There are two exceptions to this, apart from uh, the individual Leon Branchard I mentioned. Um, there was the... The, an attempt to stop the labor cons conscriptees that's not the jews but it's labor conscriptees going to uh going to germany and uh basically the, they occupy they block the the railway lines and so the, the the troops couldn't clear the railway lines and so everybody went home and then the next day they were called and they all went and it, they went the one attempt by the resistance, successful attempt by the resistance to stop one of the deportation trains was made in Belgium in April 1943. It's called Convoy 20. There's a fantastic book about it. Um, but it was uh, the initiative of a handful of Jewish resistance fighters in Belgium led by Euro Uh 23 of the people on the train died, but 231 escaped. Some of them were handed in by uh, Belgian bastards, if I can use such a term, uh, afterwards, but an awful lot of people saved their lives, had their lives saved by that action. But that's the only thing. So that's one of the big things the resistance didn't do. So to understand what happened, that we need to just get an idea of, of what the periodization, what's happening at different moments. And so from, from June 1940, from the fall of France to June 1941, which has two events. One is that strike I mentioned. The other is the German attack 
on the Soviet Union. That was absolutely fundamental for changing, in particular, the view of the Communist Party. So uh, in this period, you had individual actions, people cutting telephone wires, writing documents saying, please copy this. So little bits of propaganda, leaving it on the metro, putting it in somebody's uh, letterbox, that kind of stuff. Um, the 11th of November de demonstration. But above all, uh, the first real group we can see appear is called the Musée de l'Homme group. We now call it the Musée de l'Homme group because this is a group of intellectuals based at the Anthropology Museum. Uh, go back a bit. Um, the uh, Musée de l'Homme uh, group led by Boris Vilde, who is an Estonian, um, uh, he uh, studied, um, he, uh, yeah, I don't know what they studied, they're all anthropologists. Um, but him and uh, Agnes Umber, here we are, uh, Boris Vilde, uh, who studied shamans, that's right, he studied shamans in Finland. Um, and then uh, Agnes Umber, who went on to play an extremely significant role in the post war world. And they produced this rather uh, sad little uh, duplicated sheet called Resistance, which very uh, grandiosely claimed to be the official bulletin of the National Committee of Public Safety. Uh, the Pope Committee of Public Safety obviously was uh, harking back to the revolution. Uh, and this was just a handful of people. Uh, they did. They produced this uh, bulletin, which is not particularly brilliant, to be honest. Um, they helped some down air, down airmen. They had quite a large network. They, I mean, they claimed to be in contact with British intelligence. It's not clear whether he was. But what we do know is that some of uh, the uh, some drawings of the San Nazaire submarine pens that were made by members of this group. Uh, we eventually got to London and were involved in uh, the very famous attack on the submarine pens uh, with HMS Campbelltown in 1942. However, so you've got this tiny little group, not, I mean, nobody knows about this, you know, no, nobody at the time knew about this. This is, you know, they're producing 100 copies of a leaflet and handing it around. Nonetheless, the Germans were very interested in them. By March 1941, they were arrested, one of their members, uh, talked to the Germans, they're arrested, a trial a year later, and on February the, in February 1942, seven of the men uh, were executed. So you had a big difference between the situation in the north, where the Germans were in complete control and would carry out their repression with uh, you know, extreme brutality, and the south, where there was relative, uh, relative freedom. Uh, to move. And even there were these delusions about the Vichy state apparatus, you know, would they help us and all the rest of it. I'll just give you a list of some of the groups we have. But this difference meant there was a, the, the groups in the north were obsessed with secrecy because it was a life or death issue. Whereas the southern groups were all sitting around chatting in cafes, literally. So there was this <laughs> gulf, this difference for the first two years between those in the north and those in the south and those in the north thought the southerners were all rank amateurs who had no idea about you know what was really going on and all the rest of it so you had term of vengeance in the north you had a group called liberation again in the north run by christian pino who's a trades unionist you had another group called liberation which was uh in the south which was uh, led by vigier dastier the bloke on the bottom right uh who was an opium addict and a dandy and so he had to kick his opium habit before anybody would take him seriously. He also uh, used, uh, mobilized, uh, recruited Lucy and Raymond Obrak, who became very famous uh, after famous, the war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next to Astier, you can see this picture of Henri Frenet. Henri Frenet, as you can see, was an officer. He fought right to the very end uh, of the fighting, right up to uh, the, the, the um, uh, Pétain's uh, collapse and surrender. Uh, and he was initially extremely pro-Pétain. In his first writings, he attacked the Bolsheviks, the Freemasons and the Jews as being the cause of all this. So we can kind of see where he's coming from. Uh, but he made an astonishing political evolution, which we'll see uh, during, uh, during the war. Uh, there were other groups called Ceux de la Libération, which were really tiny, ceux de la résistance, really, really small groups. So yeah, this is what he writes in his first document. Let us hope Marshal Pétain lives long enough to support us with his great authority and his incomparable, I forgot, um, uh, prestige. That's what it says. In the yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, this was classic. What the, All the military, they did not believe that Pétain was a complete sellout, which, of course, he actually was. During this period, this initial period, the Communist Party is largely silent. And indeed, it lost most of its members because from 1939 onwards, 1938, sorry, it had been involved in a, the, the Russian state had been involved in a, 
and a pact with Hitler. So this was the Stalin-Hitler pact. And basically, or 1939, there you go. Um, basically, the Communist Party was now in a bind uh, because it said uh, the war, it was for the defeat of France during from 1939 onwards. And then, uh, in particular, anybody who was... Um, on Stalin's side, on the USSR side, well, they supported them. But now the Germans, who did support the Russians at this stage, were in a, a pact with them, had now occupied the country. So this made things extremely difficult for the Communist Party. And they produced an un underground newspaper called L'Humanité, um, but it, it was, you know... <laughs> treading a very complicated line. You had to be, you know, have a, a first class degree in dialectical materialism mm -hmm. to understand exactly the, the weaving and out they were doing. But above all, they weren't doing anything apart from doing this. They, they couldn't. There were also intelligence circuits like the Confrérie de Notre Dame and the Alliance, which is this huge MI6, mm -hmm. MI5 linked um, uh, network uh, run by Madeleine Fourcard, uh, an extraordinary uh, network often known as Noah's Ark because everybody had the name, code name was an animal. There were also two uh, organizations much more linked to the army, the Organisation Civile et Militaire, who were ex ex officers from the north, uh, very right wing, linked with Vichy intelligence. And then eventually there were kind of Vichy turncoat officers, uh, the Organisation de Resistance de l'Armée. And there were others. There was a Frontier. Uh, there were groups all over the place. Défense de la France was mainly a newspaper uh, propaganda. In the end, it was printing about half a million copies each week extraordinary is being printed all over the country clandestinely uh, and ended up any of you know france uh it ended up as a newspaper called francois which still i think just about exists uh today so the key point about all this is what group you ended up in contact with was really a matter of chance depending on who you bumped into who you met in a cafe what leaflet you you know you found put in your pocket when you're on the metro and what you thought you could do uh, it wasn't a matter of people going, oh, yes, well, actually, I think I'm, I prefer their line. I'm going to join that. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that, uh, Matthew, because it's come up a lot. Um, I was, I went, me and Mag went to a wedding a couple of years ago, and we came back by various resistance museums and what have you. And you're looking at it and saying, all of these resistance here were communists. And you go, were they? Or was it because that was the only one that was near you, and you were 18, and you wanted to strike back? And if they'd been fighting for a banner of whatever, religious, persecute, they would have joined anyway. It was about the fact they were fighting, not so much they were fighting for a cause. Obviously, there were leaders who had different aims. But I think when I look at it now as an English-speaking historian, I look at it with these labels being a little bit misleading in for actually the motivation of your average person below. Is, is that fair to say? I, I, I think, well... Perhaps not so much, and we'll see in, in particular for the, the communists in the part that I'm now about to talk, talk yeah. about. That's perhaps not the case. Um, but certainly as you get on towards, uh, as everybody gets goes from being you know, a few dozen people to tens of thousands, we end up with that half million number, yeah. then the link between the politics, perhaps the leaderships, and of the person who happens to join a group is, is tenuous, I think. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, so we had the miners' strike, uh, which is extremely important, and it showed the Communist Party, that's mainly led by communist uh, trade unionists, that there was an appetite uh, to, you know, break with this terrible problem they found themselves in, of actually, you know, in a way, even supporting uh, the occupation. They didn't do that, but that was one implication. Certainly, something people could say they did, but then, in particular, they didn't. This didn't last. This dilemma ceased almost immediately because on the 22nd of June, uh, Germany, in one of Hitler's great blunders, uh, he was not a military man, uh, thankfully, uh, he attacks the USSR and the situation changes for the Communist Party and for their youth group in particular. Um, so their youth group have been, as you might indicate, have really been, you know, struggling with this, well, we've got to wait and the kind of, you know, what the, the high ups and the, the, the KGB agents are in the leadership of the Communist Party are actually uh, telling them to just wait, 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 you know, everything is going to be OK. They wanted to they wanted to take action. I mean, as you indicate, young people do. And the Jeunesse Communiste, that's their youth group, start in Paris in particular to demonstrate uh, leaflets and then some of their leaders, in particular a man called uh, Pierre Georges, later known as Colonel Fabien, that was his, his party name, uh, started to take military action. And as you can see here in the Metro sign, uh, Barbiz Rochechoir, um, in uh, August 1941, um, he uh, 
uh, Pierre Georges shoots uh, a quartermaster who's on the metro. So I think that tells you something. I mean, this on one hand, this is a terribly symbolic act. There's a plaque. Everybody cares about it. The Germans took a massive, terrible toll for this. Immediately, they started exacting even more financial penalties, but also they started shooting hostages, 48 hostages. Right, you shoot one of our soldiers, we'll kill 48 of you. Um, and this did too, well, you know, the fact that they shot this some kind of random quartermaster. I mean, you could say, well, this is, you know, using terror, bringing terror to the terrorists. But it, did, it wasn't, you know, and he was just one, some quartermaster. It, it had, it wasn't even a flea bite on an elephant. This is just nothing mm. in military terms. However, so, yeah. in political terms, it was extremely significant. It, it did two things. On the one hand, the fact that these people are taking action meant that more people joined them, in particular the young people. But the general population, because of the terrible uh, reprisals that the German exacted, Germans exacted very quickly. They realized that this was, you know, the population was not happy about that because people were being killed. Many of them were communist uh, leaders, youth leaders, and so on, who were being executed. But uh, there was a tremendously high turnover um, of uh, membership, as roundups, executions. Basically, if you joined uh, the, um, the jeunesse, the bataillon de la jeunesse, that the youth battalions. Uh, then you had about seven months to live. That was the, as far as you were going to go. And by the end of 1942, this rather uncontrolled youth activity of shooting random soldiers, a few dozen had been shot. Um, uh, they, they did kill by accident or inadvertently, rather. They did. And they went to Nantes to kill uh, somebody and they ended up killing the military commander of the whole of the west of uh, France. They didn't know it was. It was just this German with a lot of... Uh, gold on his hat so they decided to shoot him and he turned out to be extremely significant but in general this was not uh, of any significance to in military terms you know far more important things were happening on the eastern front as far as it was concerned by the end of 1942 the communist party decides to reorganize its its armed wing and it sets up what's called the front tireur and partisan the ftp and it it begins to adopt and we'll see why a more nationalist language the communist party it sets up a kind of front organization called the national front the front national and starts to play down the communist side and play up the national liberation side during 1941 as well an extremely significant man called jean moulin who was a civil servant who'd uh resigned rather than uh kind of sign a document uh, saying that colonial so black troops had carried french troops had carried out a massacre he refused to do that tried to commit suicide uh failed um and then left his position as a senior civil servant and he starts in 1941 to visit all these resistance groups all over France. Uh, he goes to London via Lisbon. He arrives in Lisbon, tells the embassy, hey, I'm here, I've got all this information. It took six weeks for them to finally get round to saying, well, actually, this man might be significant. Um, and he eventually gets flown out uh, to London and he's still not sure what he's going to do. Here we've got an interview with the special operations executive, which was set up uh, in 1940. And he's interviewed with them uh, by them in 1941 when he arrives in London. And he's not clear about his allegiance to de Gaulle. He says in this, uh, this is in the, this is the, 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 the minutes of the meeting, uh, the interview, the matter of whether de Gaulle stayed or went could be settled afterwards. So as far as uh, Moulin was concerned, de Gaulle was a very useful symbol because he'd been making these broadcasts on the radio. Um, often people didn't think he even existed in France because mm -hmm. de Gaulle, you know, the, it's, it's this, rem, this, this, this phrase that seemed to, you know, it's like saying, wait, I'm, I'm Mr. Britain. <laughs> you think, well, wait a minute, <laughs> come on, you're making that up. So, because he was a not very well known, many people did not believe he was a real person, but that made him equally powerful. He was a symbol of French, of goal, of its resistance to the, uh, resistance to the Romans. And of course, Asterix was going to come much, much later. But, you know, this whole thing all gets terribly entangled in culture and history. Um, so what Moulin decides is that having talked to de Gaulle, he's still not certain about him, but he recognizes the importance of working with de Gaulle rather than working for the British. So he actually decides, I'm not going to work with SOE, I'm going to work uh, with the de Gaulle. And then he uh, is parachuted back. The British, Britons don't, you know, they don't bear any grudges. They parachute him back into France uh, in 1942. 
In the south of France, which is still relatively free, he discusses with Frenet and the others. And one of the main arguments, this is Frenet and they, with Chivance, another resistance leader from the south, said, what do we do? Do we become Gaullists? Because they didn't like De Gaulle at all. But London, they said, had the radio. And it was this means, this instrument, which transformed, equalised, put everyone in the same resistance. The London, the BBC broadcast uh, these radio shows from the Free French. They had an incredibly talented uh, set of songwriters, comedians. So they made, you know, they would make up little jaunty songs that would then spread all over France. You know, people would would sing them, they would whistle them, there would be jokes and so on. Uh, it was really, really important. And then from uh, the summer of 1941, there were these mysterious personal messages which were read out, you know, the carrots are cooked, I repeat, the carrots are cooked. Um, and these were messages designed by Georges Beguet. He had the idea, he was a, a, a French, uh, free French agent. And he said, well, if we could, you know, agree on this message, then I would know that, you know, a delivery was going to happen or you'd got my message or whatever. So even if we didn't have a radio ourselves, we could agree before we left that you would broadcast this and I would then know something was going to happen. So these messages, some of them were real, some of them were completely cooked up and nonsense. Uh, but that, again, you know, you didn't have to be in the resistance. You'd listen to this. And that showed you that something was Something's happening. happening somewhere out there. There were people who were doing stuff. And it didn't matter if, in fact, 90 percent of it didn't actually more, didn't produce anything or even if it was nonsense. It, it helped to create and it bound the British. The, the, I think the, it's a very good point you've made. That it's, it's the radio that is in many ways the uniting, un, unifying factor, not de Gaulle himself. It's the ability to everything coming from one central source that goes to everybody equally. Radio is a great leveler, isn't it? It was a great because these organizations, when I was doing my prep, they, as you said, they all give themselves their big grand names, the National Association of all. And you think, is this is this two people or 15 million? Oh, yeah. You have no idea, do you? Well, there was a joke that the Ceux de la Résistance, uh, Ceux de la Libération, sorry, which is called Those of the Liberation, They people would say, hey, it's, it's Celui, him of the Liberation. It's just one. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, as Magali has just said, the reprisals were absolutely terrible. They terrorized the population. They did what they were supposed to do. And they undermined the appetite from the Communist Party leadership to carry out such actions. And they, they demoralized the youth to an extent because they realized they were doing these things. Their colleagues, their comrades were dying. And yet the population was not happy with it. So those, those that, yeah, terror does work sometimes. So I think the key point is you've now got to realize you've got Moulin who's trying to get these groups together and they're you know, a load of egotistical blokes who are, I mean, some of them are pretty tiresome. Um, and uh, he's trying to defuse the rows, some of which were personal, some of which were intensely political about what the future was going to be like, and some of which were kind of tactical about what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but above all, he also, because he was a civil servant, a very smart man, he knew what they needed in the future, he was already thinking from early 1942, he's thinking about the future. He's thinking about what is going to happen. Now, the end of the war isn't decided yet, although the Americans have just joined. The Americans joined with Pearl Harbor in December 41. And de Gaulle allegedly says, right, that's it. We've won. I mean, uh, he was right. You know, I mean, he wasn't right. It was yeah, a lot, yeah, lot, yeah, lot of killing yeah. and a lot of people were going to die. But that shifted the balance. And with America coming in on the side of Britain, then to a large extent, I mean, something else happened. You need to need to the, 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 the Russians to defeat uh, the Germans at Stalingrad at the beginning of 1943. That battle lasted the whole of 1942. By the beginning of 1943, I mean, it's clear what is going to happen. Uh, there's, you know, nobody can doubt it. It was just a matter of how soon and how many more millions were going to die. So, but Moulin is thinking about this future already. And so he starts to both organize uh, civil servants within the Vichy state and within the state apparatus in the north. And he starts to organize a press service and so on. So the embryos of what will be a future de Gaulle state are mm. actually, Moulin is actually creating them. It's remarkable. So how, how important do you think Jean Moulin is? Because you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I've got Patrick Marnham's great book on Moulin. And I've been to Lyon. I've been to the, the, the house where he was arrested. And, and I'm, I'm often, I know I live in France, so perhaps I'm a little bit different to some people. I'm always surprised that British and American and Canadian people haven't heard of Jean Moulin. Because to, to me, if you've got any interest in what was happening in France in World War II, he's going to come up sooner. And to me, he's got that, 
I may be wrong. He's got the Eisenhower quality of being able to kind of play everybody. He's good. He seems to be a very good people person. Yeah. He's not, he doesn't always lay his cards on exactly what his own personal loyalties are. He's very good at making everybody feel he supports them. So I, you know, I think he's a really unsung hero outside of France. I know in France he's renowned, but would you agree that he's. Yeah, he's absolutely. I mean, he, he was fundamental for we welding the various resistance groups together and that was to be extremely significant in the future yeah. in the future but also in this thinking about what is to come trying to see what kind of state because increasingly as it becomes obvious that the war is going to end with the defeat of germany then the question comes well what world are we going to emerge into who's going to rule this country we've got all these various resistance groups we've got the allies and we've got the free french and these three forces are really from the uh, mid-1942 onwards, a kind of intention. And uh, in particular, the Allies who had a tumultuous relationship, well, the British and the Americans, that's called, had a tumultuous relationship with de Gaulle, who was a pretty stickly, uh, prickly character, it must be said. Um, they were not, they did not want to see him in power. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust the resistance because they generally didn't, really didn't trust men running around with arms, with guns. They didn't like that. And they were worried about the communists. Um, so the Allies thought they were going to occupy the country. That, that's what they expected would happen. Um, and in, in 1942, when the Allies uh, occupied uh, North Africa, and uh, they set up a Vichy, a Vichy admiral as their man. <laughs> In, in in North Africa, which caused a huge route, an unbelievable route. This is a, the Americans' brilliant idea because they'd spent all this time, you know, glad handing whilst they were not in the war. They'd spent all the time talking to people in Vichy and they were convinced that these people were just going to come over to us. So they actually put Admiral Darlan in power in what was effectively, you know, because Algeria, North, Fra North Africa was France because it's colonial nature. Mm -hmm. So this part of France that the Allies now occupied from November 1942, they put a Vichy guy in charge who'd actually, you know, implemented the uh, the, the, the anti-Semitic laws and all the rest of it. Uh, anyway, the resistance didn't fancy that. And they uh, they put a bullet in his head uh, on Christmas Eve 1942. So that didn't last long. Um, but anyway, we ended up so you've got these these three forces in France and SOE in particular, which increasingly is sending agents, organizing networks. And it's divided into two parts. You've got the RF section, which worked with the Free French and the Resistance um, and the French BCRA, which was their equivalent, their intelligence agency, the Free French Intelligence Agency. And what was called F section, which was the SOE's own networks, mainly organized around uh, sabotage and um, uh, and in intelligence collection. But this often ended in complete disaster. For example, the terrible events of Prosper, which was the name mm -hmm. of one of the yeah. networks, which everybody was arrested. Hundreds of people were arrested in 1943. It was very, very, it's, I mean, I don't think you can get over quite how dangerous uh, doing any, anything in France uh, was, in particular being involved with uh, yeah, an SOE. We've, we've had it on other. Kate, Dr. Kate Vigers came on last week or the week before and talked about Mission France. And you know, the although the the improvements to SOE SOE were clear, it went on some ups and downs and some quite considerable downs before it went up again. And the organisation it became by forty four had 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 they'd learned a lot to get that 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 efficient. Yeah. There had been these massive big disasters of lines being broken, unit you know, complete yeah. circuits being broken and, and no one could trust anybody. And it it, it was it was complicated a complicated time. Yeah. So uh by the beginning of 1943 we've got De Gaulle is a bit busy because Darlon's dead in northern so basically you know it's like if you imagine Scotland is now you know you've got an occupied Britain and Scotland is now uh, occupied by the Allies, so it's equivalent of Algeria. So uh, de Gaulle said, well, I'm going to set up my office there. I'll move from London to Algiers, thank you very kindly. And various other Allied stooges after Darlan was ass assassinated, uh, a man called Giro, was, the Allies were batting on. They were doing everything to try and stop de Gaulle taking uh, power. So de Gaulle's kind of involved in this a lot of, I mean, I'm not going to go into it because it's not about the resistance, a load of politicking in, in Algiers. You know, it's far from the sound of gunfire or any, any German troops or anything. Uh, in France, however, Moulin's work has largely succeeded. First, he gets the groups to join together in the Mouvement Uni de la Résistance, the MUR. There's a whole 
low it's an alphabet soup of initials i'm not going to yeah. go into it. you get really lost in it and it doesn't matter you really have to be a, a rivet counter to care about it um so you've got the mur on the one hand which is an overarching group and they uh they all agree that they will have on the masthead of their newspapers that they are with de gaulle so it's welding the resistance to de gaulle that was uh moulin's uh brilliant uh tactic and also uh, a kind of organization of all the uh the armed groups of various kind called the secret army, although the um, uh, the, the Communist Party d d declined to join in that. But to give you an idea of quite how crazy this period was and how odd it looks, you know, trying to make sense of it today. So Frenet, he's the guy who was the officer who had this very military view of everything. His, his newspaper, Combat, it said one leader, de Gaulle, and then it had here we got uh, you see we've got one 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 chat one one leader de Gaulle uh, only one struggle our liberties but what it also said in an early in another version of their uh, newspaper was one aim socialist republic and democracy in action and later on uh, de Gaulle um, uh, friendly would start talking about revolution. Now, he didn't he wasn't Lenin, but he was perhaps Robespierre. Mm. You know, he he thought mm. there was going to be an insurrection. So this is somebody who was completely changed from being a kind of semi-royalist in 1940, Petain fan, to now being calling for uh, revolution and insurrection. In 1943, as we go back to the previous slide, Moulin finally gets the political organization they form in the rooms uh, behind this little uh, uh it's uh I think it's a, a news agent now, Saint Paul. Um they form uh, the Conseil National de Résistance, which is a united political uh, organization, includes the Communist Party. So he's got them all on board. He's got everybody in the same tent. Uh, at the same time, the Germans, a bright spark uh, in Germany, had said, well, you know what? We've got a problem with all our troops uh, being fighting on the Eastern Front. We haven't got enough men to work the factories. Let's use some of those French lads. Let's have military conscription uh, to the army. So, as I said, 250,000 men, 250,000 18 to 20 year olds were supposed to go to Germany. So, I mean, what would you do? You wouldn't, you know, I mean, when you're 18, you're not going to go to Germany, you get bombed and have to work in a factory. So very, very quickly, they end up, they take to the hills. And this word maquis, which is a Corsican word, means scrub on the top of a mountain. Nobody knew the word. Rod Kedwood says that at the beginning of 1943, nobody had heard of it. By the middle of 1943, this word was everywhere. They would take to the Mackie. So you had tens of thousands of young men now in the hills. Oh, that was both fantastic and terrifying because you've got to feed them. You've got to arm. They're going to have to cope with the winter. It's all right very well being up in the hills in the summer. You know, it's a bit of a jolly jaunt. Uh, but in the winter when it's snowing, and it does in the French mountains and hills. That's pretty bad. So uh, you've got this major problem for the Allies about what to do with these men. But they recognize it's extremely important. At the same time, uh, this is in June 1943, the resistance suffers two blows at its leadership, General Delestrain and then Jean Moulin arrested um, and they both die. Uh, Moulin is murdered by Klaus Barbie. Um, but you know, the resistance just carries on. I mean, this this is war. People people were dying all over. It sounds crass, but it's true. So we focus on individuals and Moulin played a very significant role, but he'd done the essential thing and yeah. the resistance was able to carry on. But by now, with the Russians advancing, it's clear what is going to happen and everybody starts to think about uh, the future. So uh, the French, uh, the, the, the Communist Party were becoming extremely influential uh their another of their resistance groups called the uh, the the group manution known as the group manution uh, was carrying out resist uh, attacks in 1943 they were all arrested and shot and there was a really foul poster campaign called the red poster la fiche rouge which basically because they were all armenians and jews and you know they they weren't french they had names that were diff difficult to pronounce and this poster of their their faces was put up by the Germans saying, look, these are the resistance. You know, these they're, they're Jews, they're foreigners. You want to be with us. And this was part of the growing, I mean, it sounds bizarre, but the French state becoming increasingly fascistic. Uh, 
during the late 1943 and beginning of 1944, becoming, in fact, virtually indistinguishable from the German state itself. The Germans had occupied the southern part in 1942 when, uh, the, um, when the Allies occupied, uh, occupied uh, North Africa. Yeah. So you, the, the, the French, the Vichy France or the, the, you know, the puppet regime uh, sets up something called the militia, la milice, which was basically fascist bands. And a hot, you begin to get in the, in the hills the beginning of a kind of civil war between the Maki groups and the resistance uh, the Maki groups of resistance and the Milice, which starts to attack them with the help of the Germans. Uh, a number of terrible events took place, uh, as I said earlier, on massacres in the Glier, for example, and so on. At the same time, the resistance tries to organise itself military and get control of the military groups. So they set up something called the COMAC, the Commission Militaire de l'Action, which with everybody in the resistance agreed with. And de Gaulle said, yeah, all very well, but you're not deciding anything. No, it's, you're just going to have an advisory role. To which the resistance said, nope, we're going to decide this. Now, two of the three members, voting members of COMAT, were communists. But the other one was a very right wing resistance fighter. And he was very keen to work with the communists. He was very pleased with them. And yeah, you know, there's no, I think that the fears of a, a communist plot were well uh were, were, were exaggerated and Stalin had already agreed basically in dividing up Europe that there would be um uh you know there would there would not be any anything like uh, a Paris commune in mm. Paris that wasn't going to happen the resistance was not going to be a communist resistance um so you've got the commission militaire de l'action and then the everybody in the armed sections of the resistance start to say we're all part of the Force Française de l'Intérieur, the FFI, which was nominally controlled uh, by COMAC. So once you're still getting drops here, we've got a, an example. This is the, a, a military a weapons drop. You've got to remember that the, 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 the British and the Americans did drop weapons, but only ever light weapons. They never... And, and only when it served their own purpose. Because, you know, we've, we've, yeah. what was happening in parallel to the FFE finally being created is this is now coinciding with the Allies well underway with planning Operation Overlord for the following year. So now it's in the Allies' interests to, to, to get things going in France because of their 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 yeah. um their forthcoming invasion so yeah so two two if you like independent things become united because the, the allies now have a vested interest in what's going on there so the drops around mm -hmm. but as you say only they never dropped as much as they could and they did no never any heavy weapons no it's always light weapons I mean, what they wanted the resistance to do was what the resistance actually did which was to harry uh the germans uh as they were eventually uh retreating uh, as I said, the uh, so we got D-Day um, uh, in June, 6th of June, and then uh, 8th of June, then you've got the uh, the Americans and the, the Allies wanted to impose this Allied military government of occupied territories, AMGOT, and they even printed up funny money, monopoly money, uh, which uh, was going to be francs, but backed by the Americans. And they got a bit of a surprise. Here we go. Here's the example of the funny money. They got a bit of a surprise. So they had to let de Gaulle go on a walkabout on the 14th of June. De Gaulle's based partly in London, partly in Algiers at this time. So he flies into uh, Bayeux, which is the first town to be liberated. And the crowds greeted him with this huge applause. Here he is walking about. And it was absolutely overwhelming. And above all, all of the local state apparatus, the gendarme, the police, the, the prefect, you know, the, the civil part of the state, they all accepted him. So the Allies realised, you know what, we can't go around him. We can't avoid him. He is too significant. They built him, you know, they built him with the BBC. <laughs> and now he was out of their control. And he had the alliance, the, the allegiance of the resistance and of the uh, what was left of the, the state, of the French state that had been, you know, up until literally the day before applying the rules of the Germans now turned its coat and uh, was in support of, of de Gaulle. So... This meant that they had to reckon with de Gaulle now. So now we've got, it becomes even more acute, this three-way allies, de Gaulle and um, the resistance. What is going to happen? Uh, and it takes a long time for the uh, allies to break down the German resistance. So the, the fighting after D-Day was long and hard. And you can see it's only finally at the end of July that the allies uh, break out. And then eventually uh, they begin to, break through the German lines decisively 
And on the 15th of August, as you can see, there's the landings on the southern coast, uh, the second uh, invasion. And what that uh, meant, I mean, basically meant that France was lost. Hitler recognised this. Uh, he later he said it was the worst day in his life. Uh, well, I could have told him there was worse to come. Uh, <laughs> In a few Sunday months, April, I think 45, yeah. 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 Uh, but up until then, it was the worst moment in his life. So, and he gives up basically all the German troops the order to withdraw. So, in the next few weeks, France virtually entirely, not entirely, there's still some pockets of resistance and so on. But basically, and even there was some fighting obviously going on with the Battle of the Bulge in the winter in the Ardennes, but basically, it, it, it's over. So, the question now is what is going to happen as the Germans withdraw? Who is going to take control? And so a number of cities like Limoges, which was where Georges Gangouin was in charge, there was actually an insurrection and they had a kind of mini commune because Gangouin was communist and he was on the left of the Communist Party and he'd already had loads of run-ins with the leadership. Uh, they tried to kill him at one point. They sent uh, uh, assassins into his into his Mackie group to try and kill him. Uh, they failed um, and met a rather unpleasant fate. So uh, there were some kind of left-wing insurrections. There were factory occupations and so on, uh, in particular in the Paris region. And the Allies initially intended to go around Paris just to ignore it because it has no military significance whatsoever. It was just a lot of people that you'd have to feed. So given the supply lines are everything in a war, you got to, you know, they didn't want to start having to worry about how we're going to get food to, you know, this uh, couple of million people uh, closed up in Paris. The Parisians weren't having any of that. And a mixture I mean, this is a really complicated period. I've gone into it in great detail in my book. And you'll say, yeah, yeah. It's well. in Paris, a definitive history of the events. Um, but basically um, what happened was that the, uh, the, 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 the resistance in, Fra in, in Paris was fearful of uh, German attacks. They wanted to take action. The Allies began to wonder about what was going to happen. Uh, there were rumours about, uh, well, for example, in Warsaw, the Allies, the Germans had attacked the resistance in Warsaw. I mean, mainly because Stalin stood back on the other side of the river and said, yeah, those resistance fighters, I don't want them. You can kill them. No. Um, but certainly the German appetite for massacring of civilians uh, knew no bounds. And so that was one of the things that people were very worried about. So the, there's an insurrection in Paris and eventually uh, the Allies uh, accept that they're going to have to go to Paris. Um, so they send the second uh, armored division, Deuxième DB, which, although it was the Free French, led by General de Klerk, was part of the American army, because, of course, the French didn't have anything. De Gaulle had nothing. You know, he only had men. Uh, it was technically part of the uh, U.S. army with U.S. helmets and uniforms and all the rest of it. And a U.S. division. They go to Paris uh, and they get there on the evening of the 24th, the 25th. Uh, there's barricades, there's a lot of fighting. Um, few hundred people, mainly civilians, are uh, hurt. Here's a picture from the inside, the occupation of the Hotel de Ville, it's drinking wine, eating uh, baguette, fine French people. Um, and uh, basically, this very rapidly, the Germans give in because the Germans didn't want to fight either. I mean, the, you know, the German commander von Koltitz, he'd been in this, literally been in the city two weeks. So he hadn't, uh, you know, he, he's a man who didn't really care. He wasn't much, up, much for fighting. He, he talked a good talk, uh, in particular when he was uh, spied upon by the Allies after the war or after afterwards he was, uh, they spied upon him. So this is, this is more of the fighting, chatting to the chatting to the ladies whilst you're taking a pot shot of the German. And some of the ladies, uh, this uh, young woman here, she joined uh, the Deuxième DB uh, as they went through Chartres. She joined, uh, sorry, she went, she was from Chartres. She joined, went to join the resistance fighting uh, in Paris in her rather fantastic shorts. So basically what happens is the, 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 the Germans surrender strikingly Von Koltitz surrenders to the resistance. He signed, or the, the, resi the surrender document is signed jointly by the leader of the, the FFI, of the resistance, uh, Roll Tongi, in Paris, who's a communist, um, and by the uh, Free French. So even on the document, the surrender document, this fusion, this link between resistance and the Free French state is, is, is tightly, uh, is, is there. De Gaulle was furious about that, hated, absolutely furious but there's nothing you could do. Um, 
The next day, the 26th, this is a really important day. This massive, um, until the May 68 general strike, this is the biggest demonstration that ever took place in France. Over a million people cram into uh, the uh, the whole of the Champs-Élysées on either side of the Champs-Élysées. This, um, this is the Place de la Concorde. You see the Eiffel Tower in the background. And they're all shouting for de Gaulle. De Gaulle leads this rather ramshackle group, which is composed on the one hand of people who have been part of his free French uh, shadow administration, Alexandre Paradis, for example, who had been the, the prefect, which is a high-ranking French civil servant with no power, but de Gaulle's representative in, um, in Paris, lead members of the resistance and also the Free French Army, the Dizium uh, DB. And you can see here, we've got these, the banners that were, the, the de Gaulle, the Gaullists knew what they were doing. They rushed, rustled up these things overnight. And you can see de Gaulle to power, it says, long live mm. the Allies. Um, the Gaullist flag, FFI, is that making a reference to the, uh, the resistance. Vive de Gaulle, de Gaulle to power. Um, and although, and here we can see this fantastic image. De Gaulle was furious at first, was absolutely livid. The evening before, he'd gone to the Hotel de Ville and had uh, made a speech, very, very famous, uh, extemporized speech to uh, the pop, to the people uh, occupying people. And he talked about uh, Paris libéré par elle-même. It's fantastic speech, marvelous speech. Mm. What does he not mention? He does not mention the resistance once. He talks Paris liberated by herself, by the army, with the support and the participation of the free French. And he goes on and on. And the Allies never once mentions the resistance. Um, anyway, this, this demonstration, the 26th, is very sim symbolic because de Gaulle hated it initially because it was chaotic. And de Gaulle was, you know, he was a, <laughs> he was right up his own ass, I think we'd say. <laughs> In general, he was a military well, he was an interesting person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was, you know, he was he was a military man. He was a he was a tanky. So you know, he he wasn't particularly uh, given to the the softer things of life. And he liked order, hated chaos. Xianli, he called it during May '68, chaos. Um, and initially. He was furious at this chaotic organization, this demonstration. Uh, yes, he did mention the Allies, Magali. He talked about avec le Concorde des Alliés, uh, de, de l'Armée des Alliés. Um, uh, he, uh, he then sees this massive crowd and he goes, ah, c'est la mer, it's the sea. And he then walks down. Really, he's walking into history definitively here because there is no opposition to him. He is the symbol. He's come. He is Gaulle. He is de Gaulle. He's representing France um, in a quite remarkable way. And basically, all of the fear, th this three-way tangle that I was talking about, it's just exploded oh, yeah. in, in favour of de Gaulle. By the end, middle of September, all of the armed resistance uh, units, including the FTP, had either joined the army or disbanded and supposedly uh, given up their weapons. Oh, here's this is a great symbol. Here we go. Um, uh, we've got de Gaulle in the middle. We've got Bido, who was uh, Moulin's replacement. We've got Parody on uh, de Gaulle's right. Parody was uh, de Gaulle's kind of representative. And I, I just say it in passing because we forget this. Just Bido and Parody have been underground, not literally, you know, <laughs> metaphorically, for four or five years. Look, I mean, these men are thin. They are gaunt. They are wearing awful bad suits. You know, they are not in a in a very good state. And then also look at the man on the right. Look at the black man. Yeah. This is Georges Duxon. Uh, Georges Duxon was a uh, originally uh, from uh, Africa or his father, sorry, was from Africa. Duxon was born in France. And uh, he was a French soldier who was uh, made prisoner of war, was released uh, in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the war and came back and then ended up joining the resistance and became a, a became known as the Lion of the 17th uh, involved. in. He was wounded, as you can see. He's got his arm in a sling uh, and he helped capture a number of German tanks. Uh, and uh, you can spot him. I mean, there were a number of black fighters, but. You know, Duxon, you can spot him on photos from this period, uh, from the, the the film that was made. You can see him fighting. He's a renowned, very famous figure. Unfortunately, he ended up 
uh, rather nastily in a few weeks, about a couple of months later, he got involved in some, got involved in some um, uh, dealing on the black market and the police tried to catch him and he ran away and he was shot and he was killed. Was a bit miserable. Anyway, the, the key point about that is this, this picture symbolizes what de Gaulle wanted to do, this fusion of the state, the organized resistance and the every the empire as well which is de gaulle also wanted to to rebuild so by the middle of september this chaos this excitement was all over the factory occupations which existed around paris they'd all stopped the soe agents were ejected i mean de gaulle said to i forgot which one he was de gaulle interviewed him in bordeaux and said you've got you've got 24 hours i will arrest you for treason if you are not out of here uh, so SOE got very short shrift. I mean, the reason being that he wanted to consolidate his power. And that is exactly what he was able to do, at least for a couple of years. Things started to go all right in um, in uh, in political politics rather than military politics uh, from 1946 onwards, where things didn't go all the goals way. But even then, he ended up coming back in power uh, in 1960 and founding the, the, the Fifth Republic uh, in the chaos of the Algerian War which was one of the issues that was not resolved in all this. So what's very striking, I think one point to remember, is that on the 8th of May, so VE Day, when people are dancing again in Paris, the French Navy is bombarding parts of Algeria because there is a nationalist insurrection, because the the uh, Arab people in Algeria who had been part of the, you know, suppressed by first the, the French empire and then by uh, the germans they wanted independence and the free french weren't having any of it and so i just found that rather striking that on a day that we remember as liberty the uh algerians remember 70 odd thousand people were killed mm. after the war um yeah the uh, resistance is memorialized i mean this is a a striking example, actually, because many, you know, many French people these days would not know any of these names. I mean, I know them because I've done, done the, the period. But you see the bottom left, we've got the Saint Martyr, the five martyrs of the Lycée Buffon. These were some, they were teenagers and, you know, their teacher got arrested and they decided, right, we're going to organize a demonstration. And they threw leaflets and then the police came. So they went on the run. And then for a few weeks, they kind of tried to kill people. They didn't succeed let off bombs then they're captured and they're all murdered they're all executed poor kids um robert keller i mentioned him earlier on uh, the one on the top left he's the um he's the guy who tapped the phone the germans uh, captured his wife uh and said unless you give yourself in we're gonna kill her so he gave himself in and he was uh, he was deported and died in the camps uh he's remembered i mean i knew about him as soon as i lived in france from 84 um and there's a fantastic swimming pool in France, in Paris, called the Piscine Keller. And that's because it's run by the post office trades union. And Robert Keller is clearly one of their heroes. And there's a little shrine to him. We've got Moulin Brossolette, who was a, a socialist uh, propagandist who had a huge number of rows with Moulin. Brossolette, who was arrested and to stop himself talking, threw himself out of a five fifth story window. Mm. Um, uh, we've got Fred Scamaroni, uh, who was one of the, uh, it was involved in the, uh, Mackey, uh, who was killed. Um, yeah, yeah. Roman says he wouldn't know them. Yeah. People have forgotten these names. Renouvin, this guy on the bottom right. Uh, he was, a uh, he was kind of before the war, he was, a he was far part of the far right. He was a far right bruiser who would have fights with the communist party. And he ended up being a bruiser. Uh, for the resistance, organizing uh, hit squads of various kinds uh, that would do all sorts of things. And he was uh, shot in the end. So, yeah, the, they were post, there are no postage stamps anymore. Most of these names are forgotten. Uh, we haven't mentioned, I haven't mentioned any women. There were women involved, in particular in the, the support networks, either as being liaison agents, taking food to the Mackey, taking information to the Mackey, riding their bicycle, uh, taking uh, intelligence from one part of the resistance to another. Um, and a uh, very important leader um, of, uh, of uh, joint leader of combat with Henri Frenet uh, was a woman. She was uh, eventually executed uh, by the Germans. So uh, it was mainly a masculine uh, occupation. 
Uh, there were, I mean, we're interested in diversity these days. There were black fighters, as I've indicated. There were, yeah. there were other uh, black fighters who were involved in the fighting after the liberation of Paris. Uh, one of them was a young lad. Uh, he was taken off to um, uh, Auschwitz, uh, where he died, uh, I think, on the same day uh, and, uh, as, um, as Anne Frank. So, uh, I mean, he was from the he was from the uh, the Caribbean. So there were, you know, it wasn't just a load of middle aged old white blokes. Though there were, well, not so much middle aged. Um, yeah, there we got the woman. He, she, we got the woman in the middle of the Mackey. So she's going to be their liaison operator. She's going to go on the bike. She'll tell them the Germans are down the village. You want to move away and stuff like that. The, so women played an extremely significant uh, role, but it's been underplayed. And I know, I mean, we were talking before we started about oral history. Um, what Rod Kedward, who's one of the brilliant historians, oral historians of this period, uh, of the more social aspects of resistance rather than the, the military thing, which I've mainly been talking about, he said there would always be, he talked to a resistance fighter and there would be the woman in the doorway and she mm -hmm. would be just standing there listening. And then he'd talk to her and he would get a very different story, set of tales, understanding about what resistance meant, not simply in the kind of things I've been talking about for most of this, but in the, the non-canonical forms yeah. that resistance could take uh, for uh, in terms of just you know doing something, even listening to the radio, telling stories, telling on the Germans, saying things were going to happen, supplying food, that kind of thing. I mean, David, um, David, yeah, yeah, yeah. David O'Keefe, historian, asks the, the pertinent question about why the memory is fading regarding these 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 bigger figures. Um, my point, my reaction to that living here is I think the French remember the very top ends. They remember De Gaulle, Moulin, possibly, you know, and they remember the bottom end because they know about what happened in their corner. So you go to these little villages and there'll be that little plaque to that one resistant there who was captured, killed, whatever. But I, I think that little bit has been yeah. forgotten. The middle bit, and your because yeah. ultimately, as brilliant as you've been tonight, thank you very much. All that kind of political, which group is which, is kind of the boring bit, isn't it? In the grand picture of things. Well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you know. You so you've got to say, was it all worth it? Mm. Right? There's hundred thousand people dead. Did it? What? What was the point? So militarily, it was pointless. Right, the, the Allies were going to win anyway. You know, they, they, whatever additional help they got, okay, they know exactly what the submarine pens of Sanders Air are like. They can drive HMS Campbelltown and blow it up, and yeah, great, fantastic. They can help down them, and you know, it, it, they can harry the Germans, contribute uh, to the uh, the advance of the Allies and to the uh, the invasion in in, in on D Day. But ultimately, from a military military point of view, this is all pretty irrelevant. You know, the the, the big it with the big battles were decided at Stalingrad and then in the German advances and then uh, in, in Normandy. That That's where the real I mean, I mean that, that letter Eisenhower wrote, and I'm forgetting who he wrote it to now, but he wrote that letter where it said the resistance was worth five divisions. But yeah. I've always questioned the context of exactly what he's doing. And not very much. You know, it's I mean, I mean, and five divisions, it, there can, that can be sound like a lot or not a lot, depending on yeah. the point of view, because, yeah. you know, I remember trying to find out what you. did he mean, you know, you think, OK, division. So I'm not a military man, not a military historian. So, OK, how many people are in a division? How many men? Are, and you find a million and one definitions. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it sounds good and it, it's significant, but in the ultimate scale of things, it didn't matter. But that's not the point. It wasn't a military it was a political thing. It was all about politics because it's about, you know, OK, so after the war, de Gaulle can say, ah, la France résistante, and loads of people turned their coat, you know, bastards like Bousquet, who had been a, you know, a heart of the, of the uh, Vichy state apparatus, turns his coat at the last minute and then ends up with a free pass and, mm -hmm. you know, is only is finally kind of discredited in the 1980s. I mean, it's absolutely scandalous. There was no yeah. purging. Of the, I think you could definitely make the case that of the occupied country, the, vic the victorious countries, given the de Gaulle's influence, it was the most organized and stable in that 1945 period by the people that actually achieved that victory. I mean, Americans get very surprised that 
by the end of the war, Churchill was no longer in power in Britain because the Labour government, in my opinion, the best government of the 20th century, um, and Attlee is in is in charge. Thank thank heaven for Attlee. I think that one other underrated figure, but. <laughs> But France is in a very strong. I mean, the fact they were they were one of the occupying nations. I mean, Belgium, yeah, were, Norway, they get, were. Seat, they get their seat, you know, in the Security Council of the UN, and uh, you know, and then very quickly they got a nuclear bomb and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I mean, all that. That's what De Gaulle wanted to do. He wants yeah. to reconstruct the country, and that's why there was no perch. That's why he said, you know, La France résistante. La France was in, uh, uh, La France c'était à Londres. France was in London, and that's why your point you started with is people not, uh, you know, the French basically kidding themselves. Well, we were all fighting, weren't we? And the fact that it was, it took Jacques Chirac, Jacques Chirac, a man who I have little time for, but for that one act that he apologised for the, the actions of Vichy France and of the French state, well, not in Vichy, of the French state in occupied Paris, in the Raffler, uh, the uh, uh, I mean, the Raffler has been a, uh, only recently is it something people, I mean, people even talked about. You know, there's the film with Jean Reno made what five, six years ago now, but you know, I hadn't heard about that 25 years ago. It so was Chirac, very... Chirac, Chirac apologized for that in the early 90s, and the only reason he could do that is that he was not involved. Yeah, all yeah. of the others, all of the other presidents had, in one way or another, an, an, a, a connection to the war period, and they couldn't break with it. And Mitterrand certainly couldn't. I mean, it was a very, yeah. very complicated relationship with uh, the resistance. He was one of those people who was part of the Vichy apparatus and then not part of the Vichy apparatus and, and so on. Um, and his friendship with Bousquet. Good God, my God. Mm. Um, so you've got this situation in which basically to have national unity, which de Gaulle valued amongst, above everything else, right? Um, and you can see... It was the 200th anniversary of uh, Napoleon's death yesterday. That's partly what de Gaulle was doing. You know, Napoleon wades in after in you know 1799 and stops the chaos of the of the revolution, stamps his authority, and has new laws and new relationships and new ways of doing things. And it's now fixed. He kills the revolution. He's the grave digger of the revolution in some respects. Yeah. And that's really what de Gaulle was doing. The chaos was now going to stop. He was acting as a Bonapartist figure in that post-war period, he was saying, right, I am the state, you can rely on me, come to me, my little one. You know, lots of mis <laughs> misarnage. He took advantage of the chaos to, for, for, yeah. for personal, I mean, and it's also, I, I wanted to mention something, then we will bring things to an end, is that there's a chap, Mag and I know here in Normandy in San, he died last year, who was who was in the street in Bayer when de Gaulle came down yeah, in June 1944, and you know, we asked him, he said, I had no idea who I was looking for, I had no <laughs> idea what this guy looked like, I or what he sounded like, and that's, we forget that, because Churchill was, it was his image was known by everybody. MacArthur, I know he's not a president, but he's MacArthur's image pipe hat was known. But de Gaulle, until he got to France, most French could have would have walked past well, him. How would, the known? how would they have known? They didn't know internet. The world was in black and white back then. Yeah, exactly. And, so, you know, they didn't have pictures in their, their newspapers and their crappy little Veronia typed uh, leaflets didn't have pictures in them. And why would you put a picture of de Gaulle anyway? I mean, people didn't hear his voice and he did speak, but he didn't speak that often. So no, he was he, more just referred to. And as I said, be, you know, you thought he was a code name. Made up. They didn't exist. It was, it was a figurehead yeah. that didn't exist. It was a phantom figure. And that's, that's extraordinary because in all of us now, when we think de Gaulle, just that being the image comes into our head, you know, and, but, but yeah. for people of France, and everything. Yeah. they loved him before they knew who he was really. That's, they they, that's, they that's, knew an that's idea. Very nicely put. Suppose, that's very nicely yeah. put. Yeah. And this also explains why, <laughs> The French love the BBC so much, which they do, and they still do. And they it's do. always been a, a, you know, the because of this fundamental role that it played in being a voice for France when France was occupied. Uh, and one of the things that has bemused me is the BBC's lack of interest in doing this. I've re tried repeatedly over the last 15 years to get the BBC to make a programme about it. Uh, and they, they've completely failed. They did make, finally, Julia, Julian Jackson got them to make a, a, a programme about the uh, the 10th of, um, in 2020. So with the uh, what is 80th anniversary mm. of the uh, 18th of June uh, appeal, he managed to get a one hour program about that, but it wasn't about the role of the BBC. And, you know, there are books written about academics study this, historians of radio study this, and you can't 
You can't understand the Second World War without understanding the role of the BBC. During the liberation of Paris, for reasons that, I mean, I've, tr I've talked to the people who wrote the script and they don't know what happens. There was a cock up. They announced the liberation of Paris on the 22nd of August. Didn't happen until the 25th. So the bells rang all over Europe. Well, over, over in Britain, in Manchester, in Glasgow, in New York. The New York Times had an article about it. Paris is liberation. We can start thinking about fashion again. Literally, that's what it said yeah, on the yeah, 23rd yeah. Of, of, of August. And this wasn't true. Something had gone terribly wrong. So the BBC had this enormous influence. In well, that, that makes, that, it took me ages. There's, I think it's Hermanville, that behind Swordbeat, where there's a plaque there because it said this bell sounded ah, yeah. on August 22nd. And when I first said, no, it. That wasn't the day Paris was liberated. And then you read the bit behind you go, now that's when we thought it, because the that's BBC right. told so, us, and if this, the BBC this, said, you know. Yeah, the Parisian memoirs, because I've read loads, read loads of people's diaries, they're all going, what? What are they talking about? I, You know, there's still fighting going on. I can hear gunshots. You know, there's still, this, this, the Germans are still here. Why are they saying we've been liberated? It's not. It's not quite clear what was going on there. I, I mean, and I it's, think it's interesting to think that there was a period when the BBC was was considered the paragon of all knowledge and wisdom and clarity. Oh, yeah. And you know, absolutely. It's a bit not quite the same now. Anyway, we could. We're, we're for fear of going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I have absolutely thoroughly enjoyed tonight, Matthew. I so have people watching as well because it it has filled out this story. That that bit of the. The, the the group creation and the Mulan's role has been really really fascinating. I think when we have come back and Roman joins us tomorrow to talk about the, the resistance in Normandy, that will be fascinating as well. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. um, for someone who said to me in an email a few days ago, you, you have to you, you have to go and check all this up again. It's all been pouring out amazing. Yeah, here, mate. I've got an auto cue. Well, no, it was really really good. So I'm just going to remind people what they've got coming up. Then I'll come back to you in a second and say thank you. So, folks. We've got two shows tomorrow, so at 2, 2 p.m. UK time, we've got Sophie Polderman's coming on from the Netherlands talking about those three Dutch women who were seducing and killing Nazis in World War II. That would be extraordinary. And then at 7 o'clock in the evening, so same time as this show, we have Romain, who's been joining in the comments, talking about the resistance in Normandy. So that will bring to a close Resistance and Spies Week on World War II TV. But right now, it remains me to say thank you very much, Matthew. That was really, really good. I'm going to go and play that and watch that again. I really enjoyed that. I enjoy all my shows. Right. Um, and if you want to come back on sometime and talk about Paris particularly, yeah. because we could yeah. do that at some okay. point, I'd like to talk about that. August. Yeah, I mean, we'd be, we, what we could try and do is get some cameras in Paris for you, because I do that on my live stream, is get cameras there in the places where things happen. We can well, think about fantastic. that for August. That would be good. That'd be brilliant. Um, but anyway, thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. Don't forget, folks, the links to Matthew's books are in the in the uh, description below. You can find them there. You can find me on Twitter. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon. Um, and as a good starting point to understand the French resistance, Matthew's book is highly regarded and 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 worth getting. Um, and and there aren't many books in English language about the resistance when you actually break it down. Lots of great French ones, but they, 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 we were talking about that, about that Mag and I earlier about the fact that French historians write for the French and British write for the British and not enough cross-pollination. Well, I tried to get them to translate it and they just went, is he a professor of history? No. Yeah, that's, well. Oh, there you go. Anyway, well, thank you very much, Matthew. And everybody for watching, <laughs> thank you very much. And we will see you all again in World War II uh, TV very shortly. Thanks for watching. Brilliant. Have a good evening, everybody. Cheers. Okay, thank you very much. See you then. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everybody.